take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 78. Psalm 78. Talking about being steadfast in our commitment to life. You know, it saddens me that over the 46 years that we've been in this battle for life, that so many denominations have changed their view on this issue. I'm here to tell you today, I've been in ministry for 30 years. I've been alive for 55 years. My attitude on life has not changed, Amen. will not change ever. Amen. Amen? And that's why I'm glad I'm part of an independent Baptist church, because we're not dictated by any denomination. Our, this body of believers determines the position of this church, not some corporate headquarters somewhere else. And that's, that is a blessing, and that's the way it ought to be. The, the issue of life is the fact that life is from God. He created it. He designed the biology for it. He's the giver of it. He ought to be the taker of it. Amen? Amen. I love the theme for this year's uh, March for Life. Uh, unique from beginning. Unique from beginning. Acknowledging that every human being is unique creation of God from conception. Amen. Amen. The moment that takes place, an eternal soul has existed, created the image of God. See, we've gotten so smart in our country, we've created all kinds of problems God never intended to be issues. And we need to, we need to get back to the Word of God. Amen. And I want to challenge you to call your representatives, call your senators on the state level and on the federal level this week and let them know your position on this issue. I'm thankful we do have a representative that has voted consistently in regards to the protection of life. Unfortunately, we have two senators that have consistently not done so. And we need to speak up against that. I forget, how, how did you put it, Kevin? Help me out. I, I was going, I'm quoting Kevin. This is a Kevinism. I can't take any credit for it. How did you say it in class today? Exactly. That is the world we've come to today. I've given you some sad and sobering statistics in the pastor's paragraph. I'd encourage you to read it. 46 years this battle's been going on. Over 60 billion, or excuse me, 60 million lives have been taken into eternity. That's a sad reality. That's a sad reality. In fact, I found a website where they have a, they have a, a counter. And it was, it was shocking how those numbers changed each day. I think in, your, I think in the pastor's paragraph, I says more than one a minute. Because I counted 1,001, 1,002, 1,003 as that thing counted. And it was past one and going to the second one when I got done with a minute. This is a matter that we cannot be silent on and we cannot change on. I'm thankful that uh, Brother Bad Brad Wells, who Brother Martin is going to go serve with, he and uh, another, some other folks from his church were there since their church is in D.C., it was very easy for them to go to the March for Life. And he had a post on Instagram with them there at the march. Hundreds of thousands of people speaking up for the unborn. The voices that, the, peop the ones that have no voice, they were speaking up for. I personally, I don't, I, you, you can have your political persuasion. I, I I'm not worried about that, but I'm personally thankful 
for a vice president that was there personally with his wife. I'm personally thankful for a president that was, had a video uh, presentation for that event. Amen. This is something we need, to, we need to be concerned about for our nation. Here in this text, I want to read verses 1 through 12. And I want to share with you some thoughts about our commitment to the next generation. We need to be committed to the next generation, first of all, in letting them be born. Amen? Here in this passage, it says, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. Parents, we need to make sure our children hear from us truths from this book. Amen. They need to know why we believe in the value of life, and they, they need to make their own decision. We cannot determine our children's philosophy, right? But we can influence it with truth, amen? amen. We can't determine their beliefs, but we can share with them our beliefs, amen? amen? And it says, we have known and we have heard and our fathers have told us. And, and if we're going to be committed to the next generation, we've got, to, we've got to communicate them what we believe and why we believe it. Don't just tell them what you believe. Tell them why you believe it. So that they can discern for themselves if they want to believe that or not. Amen? They don't need to believe it because we believe it. Right? Their belief needs to be deeper than our belief. Their convictions need to be their convictions, not our convictions polarized on them. I've told every one of my kids, you don't have to like how I raise you. You just have to deal with it. One day you're going to be the parent. You can do it how you want, but you're going to answer to God for how you do it, just like I answer to God for how I do it, right? You don't have to believe what I believe, but as long as I'm raising you, you're going to come to church with me. And, uh, but when you get out on your own, you can do what you want because you're answering to God then for yourself. You've got to deal with him at that point. All I can do is help get you ready. It says, we will not hide them from their children. So one generation not hiding the truths of God from another generation, showing unto the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony. Aren't you thankful for the testimony of the Lord in the Word of God? Amen. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make their own, that they should make them known unto their children. That's our job. That we're to make known the truths of God to our children. Listen to this that the generation to come might know them. That's a generation not even born yet. Amen? See, one, we're talking about three different generations here. Actually, four. We'll get to the next one here in a little. We, we're talking about, we're talking about the, the, the grandparents teaching the, the parents because they were raising them. So those parents who are the children of the grandparents can teach their children, which are the grandchildren of the grandparents, so that when those children have their children that aren't even born yet, they'll be teaching them about the Lord too. Amen. You want to know why there's a decline in churches today? Because individuals have not been following God's plan. Anytime one generation does not pass their faith to another generation, there's a gap. says, here's the reason why. That they may set their hope in God. See, I can't make my children trust Christ. They may pray a prayer to, that they think might please me. But you know what really pleases me? Truth pleases me. When they truly believe God, when they truly follow God, that is what pleases me. John said, I have no greater joy than that my children walk in truth. Amen. See, I can't make them believe God. I can't make them believe this book. I can't make them believe anything. I can't make them be Republican, right? Can't do that. That's not even my job, is it? No. All I can do is model my faith, model my beliefs. 
I can articulate my faith and articulate my beliefs. I can give the reason for what I believe. But at the, at, at the end of the day, they have to formulate their beliefs for them. Because that's the only way they're going to stick. The text goes on and it says that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. See, if they do it for us, it'll get forgotten, right? But if they do it for God, it won't get forgotten. He goes on and it says, and might, might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation. You know what I hope for my children? I hope a better walk with God than I have. Amen? I hope for progress. I hope for them to come to faith earlier and be, be strong in their faith sooner. I hope better for them than what I've experienced myself. It says, The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows and turned back in the day of battle, they kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law. That's not, that's not, I don't want them to be that way. The world doesn't need more Christians doing that. And forget his works and his wonders that he showed them. And the marvelous things that he, that he did, did he in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zoan. And it goes on and it enumerates a lot of these wondrous things that God did. But my friend, I want you to... I want you to work with me through this text and let's look at some things that will help us to be steadfast in our commitment to the next generation. First of all, look at this steadfastly listening to God. In the very first verse it says, Give ear, O my people, to my law and incline your ears to the words of my mouth. See, if we're going to be steadfast and to, committed to the next generation, we, this generation needs to listen to God. Amen. Amen? We need to listen to God in our life. Hey, parents, let me help you something. You cannot teach what you do not know. Right. If it ain't real with you, it, you can't communicate it to be real with them. See, we've got to be committed to listening to God in our lives. We've got to listen to God. We've got to let God speak to our hearts. We've got to get into his book and let his book speak to us. We've got, to be, we've got to have the Spirit living within us so He can teach us His book. And we've got to be in tune with the Spirit so we are teachable, amen? Right. See, we've got to listen to God. We've got to listen to Him as His creator. It says, oh, my people. You know, everybody here is, is in one sense the people of God, saved or unsaved. You know why? Because everybody here is created by God. Now, I know there's some that may not believe that. There's some that may not believe in creation and may not believe in God even. But I'm telling you, the, the fact is, one day they're going to find out that he is real and they're going to have to deal with him. And he did create them and he created them in, their Im, in his image and he created them for his glory, right? One day the facts are going to be the facts. But the bottom line is, we are all created by God and we need to listen to him as his creation. But you know what? For some here, you need to listen to God for a greater reason than being created by Him. You need to listen to God because you're His child. Amen? Amen. Many years ago, I had a nephew. I will not disclose which one. And he was not behaving well. He was a very little guy. And, um, and I was getting on to him for not behaving well. And he says, I don't have to list you. You're not my daddy. Was he correct? I was not his daddy. And I said, well, you're right, but I can go talk to your daddy if you want me to. And he said, no, that's okay. <laughs> amen? Smart kid. He's grown up a lot since then, amen. But you know what? If my child said that, <laughs> we'd have a whole different conversation than I'll talk to your daddy about that, right? Why? Because he is my child, right? right? See, if you're born again, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, you need to listen to God, your Father, amen? Not just your creator, your Father. 
Because he does have some authority over you. See, as believers, we are children of God before we are children of our forefathers. As believers, we are children of God before we're even Americans. And as believers, we ought to be children of God before being a Democrat or a Republican. Amen? Amen. And we need to listen to God more than we listen to Fox News or CNN. We need to get our beliefs from God and his word, not from the public media. Amen? If we're a child of God, he ought to be more important, and what he says ought to be more important than public opinion. I don't care what the polls are. I care what God says. Somebody says, Pastor, don't you know what you preach is not real popular? Yeah. I've gotten hate mail before, and guess what? I don't care. I preach for an audience of one. You just get the, you just deal with it, right? That's the bottom line. I preach what he tells me to preach. You either listen or reject it. That's your business. I answer to God for me saying what he tells me to say. You answer to God for how you deal with it, right? We need to get this in order, right? We got way too many Christians getting their beliefs from Fox News instead of the Word of God. By the way, Fox News is not the Christian news station. Okay? It may be conservative. It is not Christian. Every announcer on there is not a Christian. Don't get that brainwash in your head. It's not the Christian news station. It is conservative. And it is definitely biased Republican. But don't let people throw stones at that. The facts are the facts. CNN is biased Democrat, right? We just, let, we just need to admit it, right? Let's not hide it. It's just fact. But you know what? This book is, is just truth. Amen. This book is truth, and we need to know what this book says. This is what needs to shape our beliefs. See, we need to listen to him because he's given us a charge. And we are his charge. You know what that means? It means we're his servants. Right? And last time I checked, a servant really does need to listen to the master, right? The subject really needs to listen to the king, right? The charge needs to listen to the charger, right? The one giving the charge. We need to listen to God. We need to listen to his word. We are his representatives here on this earth. If we don't have his message, we cannot represent it. We are his messengers. If we don't have his message, we cannot declare it. We are his stewards. And he's given us a charge to occupy till he returns. And one day he's going to return, and we're going to give an account to him for how we occupied the charge he gave us in fulfilling his word. See, we need to listen to him. We need to give our attention to him. We need to give our attention to him. It says, it says, oh, oh, it says in the text, oh, give ear, give, give ear, O oh my people, to my law, and incline your ears to the words of my mouth. You know what the word incline means? To give attention to God willingly. I've, I've seen people sometimes do this. Have you ever seen anybody do that? What are they doing? Even when I do that right now, it changes what I'm hearing. It amplifies it. Why? Because I have more space catching the the information and channeling it into my ear. That's exactly what this word means in the Hebrew. It means to listen on purpose. It means to direct the ear toward. It means to broaden out the ear. That is literally what it means. I wasn't making it up. You can look it up in a Hebrew lexicon if you want. I'm just telling you that's what it means. To broaden the ear. To listen on purpose and do it submissively. When you do this, you do it because you want to hear what is being said. Right? And that's exactly how we ought to treat this book. We ought to want to hear what it says. Because it's God's book. We need to listen. We need to direct our listening to God purposefully. We need to direct our listening to God purposefully. We need to not bend away from it. We need to bend toward it. We need to let God's word speak to our hearts. 
We need to listen on purpose intentionally. Amen? Everybody wants to talk about intentionality. Well, let's get intentional about this book. Amen? Amen? We need to listen on purpose intentionally. And you know what our purpose ought to be? Intentional? Our intent ought to be? Obedience. And this book talks a lot about life, and we need to obey it. But the solution is not bombing abortion clinics, because that is just evil. Right? Because that's violating another truth of Scripture, right? The solution is confronting people with truth. You know why a lot of people are moving, shifting? And we live in a day and age where there's a huge shift on this issue right now. Far more than ever before in the 46 years of this issue. People are shifting more. And I'll tell you why. Science. Science. Ultrasounds are so advanced now. 3D imaging is so advanced now. People see the reality of life in the womb. And they are taking, they are taking samples that are showing life in, in, at the beginning. The uniqueness, the DNA uniqueness of life in the beginning. God's handprint is on that. One of the speakers at the, at the March for Life was a young lady who is a biology major at Princeton University. In case you didn't know, that's not a slouch place. She, is, she wants to be a biology major because she wants to go in the field of biology. She wants to do research to defend the issue of life. She's dedicated herself to that. You know why? She was born with, I forget the fancy name for it, but basically brittle bone disease. And her parents were told, you need to abort this baby because of all of the difficulty it's going to have. And she was there to say all the difficulty was worth it and thank her parents for not listening to the professionals. In this church, there's been people that have been told, you're going to have this, you're going to have that, you're going to have the other, you're going to have the other. And they said, no, we're not going to listen to you, we're going to listen to the Bible. And they just, they just obeyed God, and God took care of the whole thing, amen? Even if somebody does have special needs, they're still created in the image of God, right? And they still need to be valued, right? See, we need to listen to God on purpose, for the purpose of obedience. And we need to listen intently so we can understand accurately and we can obey fully. You cannot articulate what you do not understand accurately. And you need to understand what the Bible says about the issue of life so you can articulate a legitimate argument. There's a ministry that had a representative there that spoke also. And their whole, their whole ministry is to reach the soul of those that have been deceived by uh, the abortion ideology. You know what she was before she got saved? A manager of a Planned Parenthood office. You know what changed her? Ultrasound imaging. She saw what she was doing and she got out of the industry, it is an industry by the way, and, she, and she, she was grieved in her heart. You know what that's called? Conviction. But she didn't get depressed, she sought hope. Guess where she sought it? Amen. One of the things I'm thankful for with Next Step, my wife has been involved in it, is the abortion recovery ministry helping people with this book right here to be healed from the hurt of abortion. There is hope. It's called the grace of God. Amen. And get, last time I checked, every sinner was a benefactor of the grace of God, right? We, don't, we can't cherry pick what the sins are, right? right? God can forgive every sin but the sin of unbelief, amen? amen. And once you believe, you're not guilty of that sin anymore either, amen? amen. Woohoo! God's word is good, amen? See, we need to just trust the Lord. We need to be steadfastly honoring God's word. If we, if we, we need to listen to it, and if we honor it, we'll listen to it more. And if we're honoring God's word, what it says is truth. 
And we don't want to argue with it. We don't want to debate it. We want to accept it as it is and go with it, right? It, yeah, that's a whole other subject. I don't want to get sidetracked. Let me stay on track here. See, I can do that. See, I just did that. I wanted to go one way, and I stayed here. Aren't you proud of me? Thank you very much. <laughs> See, we need to honor God's word steadfastly. You know why? Because it's the inspired and preserved word of God. Amen. Notice what it says. My law. God is speaking to his people. He says, my law, my words, out of my mouth... You know what that's called? Inspiration. Inspiration. The word inspiration used in, in Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.16, means to breathe out. Because that's how, you, that's how you say words. Air comes out of your diaphragm, and it comes across your vocal cords, and your mouth, and your tongue, and your teeth shape uh, words, and it comes out, and people hear it, right? That's exactly how God gave his word. Holy men of old, 1 Peter, holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. God inspired his word. That's why we don't need to change it. We don't need to update it. It is his word, and we need to let it be his word. Amen? See, it's inspired, and it's preserved. It is his law. It is his words given out of his mouth, recorded by his servants. And those servants were given the responsibility to protect it. You know why they were given the responsibility to protect it? So every generation can know, thus saith the Lord. Amen. See, we need to honor God's word as God's word. And you know, what we, you know how we need to honor God's word as God's word? We need to honor it by letting God speak for himself from his word. He says, the words of my mouth. He says, I will open my mouth. I will utter dark sayings. We need to speak, thus saith the Lord. Amen. You know what has the power to change hearts? This book right here. Amen. Not my opinion. Not my ideology. Not my political beliefs. Thus saith the Lord has the power to change hearts. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. My Bible still says that in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. See, we need to let God speak from his word. And then we need to obey his word. And you know what? We need to let others teach us his word accurately. We need to learn from what they have learned from studying the word of God. We need to... We need to learn from what they have seen God do in their lives. And that's why older people, you, you grandparents here, you need to communicate to your grandkids the things that God has taught you from this book so they can learn them sooner than you learn them. Amen? That's what we need to do even as parents, to teach our kids what we've learned so they can learn it sooner than we did. See, we need to learn from others, letting them teach us. That's why it's important to be in Bible study. That's why it's important to, to be under the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. You know what? I've come to the conclusion you can't have too much Bible. Amen. You can't. You cannot have too much Bible. And my Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner some is, and the more as you see the day approaching. We live in a day and age churches are dropping services According to that verse, we ought to be adding services, not dropping them. And guess what? In our church, we did have, add a service. Last year, we added a 1 o'clock Wednesday afternoon service for folks that don't like coming out at night. And guess what? We had 13 souls there this past week. See, we need to honor God's word as God's word. And when it speaks on the issue of life, we need to be committed to the next generation. We need to be steadfastly committed to the next generation. How are we going to do that? Well, this text outlines how we're going to do that. We need to value them as image bearers of God. You know, the verse we read, the passage we read in our call to worship, we read it was... Psalm 127.3, Lo, children are heritage of the Lord. Go back to that. Sorry about that. Go back. That's, that's good right there. Somebody texted me this. I think it was Linda. She's guilty. 
But look at what that says. Live in such a way that those who know you but don't know God will come to know God because they know you. Man, that's a good statement, amen? See, we need to let this book influence us by listening to it, by respecting it, so that we can portray the image of God clearly. See, our children are image bearers of God. We are image bearers of God. We need to know the one we're supposed to be bearing the image of so we can bear the image well, amen? That's why we need to be in the book, and that's why we need to teach our children. See, we need to honor our children as being image bearers of God. We need to value them. Children are a heritage of the Lord. Children that, that should be born. Here in this text, it talks about those that are not even born yet. We need, to, we need to teach those behind us so they can teach those coming behind them that aren't even born yet. My friend, that is being committed to the next generation. See, we need to communicate the Lord clearly so the generation not even born yet can know about him. The ones who would be born in the future, the ones that should be allowed to be born. And you know what? When we're valuing life, the ones that should be born will be born. Amen? Amen. We need to value life. We need to be committed to the next generation by valuing them as image bearers of God. The ones God gives life to and enables to experience that life fully. Some people want to legitimize abortion on the fact that sometimes nature itself, just a, a, an embryo that, or a, a, a baby that is conceived does not, is not born. And they want to use that to justify abortion. No, my friend, that's in God's hands, amen? And you say, why did God let that happen? How many have ever asked, God, why did you let that happen? Be honest. I have. Here's the answer. We may never know. Because he's God and we're not. And his ways are above our ways. And if we know he's God, we've got to let him be God. Amen? And not give up on him when he's God. We've got to trust him when he's God. See, we need to value our children and the next generation as image bearers of God who would help the next generation also know God. See, this generation needs to train the next generation so they can train the next generation so the generation that's not even born yet can know. And sad reality is far too many times one generation has skipped the beat. You read it in Judges. Between Joshua and Judges, there's a generation that knew God. And the next generation, they turned away from God because they did not know God. You know how this church is going to stay right? We need to invest in the next generation. We need to have children's ministry. We need to have youth ministry. We need to encourage children to come to church. We need to encourage teenagers to come to church. And you older folks, don't get disconnected with the teenagers. When we have a gap luncheon, go to the gap luncheon. Because those teenagers need to hear from the older generation about their love for God. Do not abandon the youth of our community and our church. It saddens me when we have a youth service and there's not very many white heads out here. We need to invest in the next generation. We need to encourage the next generation. Do not abandon the younger generation. Amen? Amen? We need to value them as image bearers of God and let them know that we care about them as fathers. You know what? It takes more to be a father than procreation. We need fathers that raise children, not just produce them. That's part of what's destroying our country. Fathers producing children, not raising them. We need to raise young men to be men not to abandon their responsibility of their children. We need to train our young men to raise their children up to know God. We need to invest in the next generation. We need to help them know God, whose image they bear. You know, in verse 4 it says, not hiding from them. Don't hide from them what you believe about God. Tell them what you believe about God. It says... 
showing forth the praises of his, and the strength of his work. We need, to, we need to tell them about what he's done in our lives. We need to let them know and not hide it from them that they, that they may know uh, the one that's done all these great things. See, the children, children that came that were born in the wilderness, they weren't in Egypt. They didn't see God do those miracles. They didn't see God uh, deal with all of the false gods of the Egyptians. They didn't see that. It was up to the generation that saw it to communicate it to the generation that didn't see it. Why? That they would set their hope in God. See, we need to let our kids know what God's done in our lives so they can set their hope in a God that they know and a, and a God that they believe in themselves. See, when, when you set something, you do it on purpose, right? If you just go in the house and you throw something, it can land wherever, right? My kids sometimes say that. I didn't mean for it to hit that. Well, when you let go of it, you meant to do that, right? The accident may have been an accident, but letting go of it was not an accident, right? But when you take something and you set it, accidents don't happen that way, do they? It's on purpose, what, right? Why? Because you care about it, right? See, here it says that they may set their heart on God. Another reason why I, I believe in the Bible, that you have to make your own choice to trust Christ. You've got to set your heart toward the Lord. You've got to know God that you can believe God and by hearing the truth of God and letting it work faith in you so you can trust God, but you've got to trust God for you. I cannot trust God for you. Your parents can't trust God for you. You've got to trust God for you. Amen? That's the only way it's going to be real, when you trust God for you. We can, like even with Ruth, we can pray for her to trust God. We can teach her about trusting God. If she stays in this church, she'll go through Sunday school and children's church and all of that. Why? Teaching her about God. Her parents are going to teach her about God. But the bottom line, at the end of the day, she's got to trust God for her. Amen? You've got to set your heart that they might set their heart. It's based on what they know about God as to whether they're going to trust God. It says, notice this setting of their hope and their heart is done by the individual. See, we've got to set, if we're going to set our hope in him, we've got to set our heart on him. That's what faith and salvation is all about. Setting your heart and hope in the Lord. Doing it personally. And then helping them know him through his word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Our kids need to, to, know, to hear this book. They need to hear about the God of this book. They, they need to hear from the God of this book so they can trust the God of this book. Notice it says here in this passage that they did not keep his covenant in verse 10. They kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law. Bottom line is, there's no guarantee with our kids. They, they aren't robots. You don't program them in you don't program them in. You don't program them in. And they automatically come out right. Right? They've got to do it for themselves. I can't make my kids turn out right. But I can point them in the right direction. I can put up some roadblocks in regards to the wrong directions, right? But they've got to set their heart on God. They've got to trust God. They've got to follow God. They've got to make their covenant with God. Or they can refuse to walk in it. It's their choice. See, and notice who he's talking here. He's saying, communicate this to the next generation that they won't be like their fathers, right? Somebody says, there's no hope for me because of my dad. He was a scoundrel, therefore I'm going to be a scoundrel. Have you ever heard something like that? That's barring the grace of God. Can the grace of God change family heritage? 
Yes, the grace of God can. And that's exactly what God's challenging this generation. Don't be like your fathers. Don't be like them. They forgot God. They forgot his wondrous works. They, they turned away from him. They didn't keep their covenant with him. But you have your own choice to make. You don't have to be the way you were raised. You can either be better than the way you were raised, or you can be worse than the way you were raised, right? It's really up to you, right? And that's exactly what God's challenging these people with. Don't be like your fathers who were stubborn and stiff-necked and rebelled against God. Be like who God wants you to be. Trusting God, following God, living for God, and being used by God to make a difference on this earth. It's amazing if you look at the family history of people. Some very great people came from some very terrible families. And some very wicked people came from some very great families. Right? We are not a product of our environment. I understand humanism teaches that. But we are not. And we are not dictated completely by our genetics. Amen? Blood pressure. Here's, this is conviction on me right here. I could say I struggle with blood pressure because my parents struggle with blood pressure. Is that correct? Yes or no? Yes, to a point. But if I'm eating potato chips, is that my parents' fault? Huh? No. Is that helping my blood pressure? No. If I'm sitting down eating an entire bag of potato chips, is that helping my blood pressure? Is that my parents' fault? No. But if I get... And I take a walk around the block. Oops, I just lost some. And I take a walk around the block. Is that my parents' fault? No. That's my choice. Is that helping my blood pressure? Yes. Amen. You can either blame where you are right. on where you came from, or you can change where you're headed because of who you know. And that's exactly what God's challenging the children of Israel about in this generation in Psalm 78. How about you today? Let's pray.